Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done about 520 of them now, and if this, if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to the upcoming, no, excuse me, go to the past interviews menu on batgap.com and you'll see all the past ones organized in several different ways. This program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, so if you appreciate it and would like to support it, uh, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. <clears throat> My guest today is Henry Schuchman. Henry is the guiding teacher of Mountain Cloud Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He is an associate Zen master of Sanbo Zen and continues his training under, I'll probably mispronounce this, Abbot Yamada Rion Roshi. He has an MA from Cambridge in the UK and a master's in literature from St. Andrews University. He's worked as a writer and poet for many years publishing extensively and winning numerous awards, as well as teaching in various institutions in Britain and America, including Oxford Brookes University and the Institute of American Indian Arts. Henry is a writer and poet of British Jewish origin who has published eight books to date of fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. He writes regularly for Tricycle, the New York Times, and other publications. And his most recent book is the poetry collection Archangel. He lives near the center of Santa Fe, New Mexico, with his wife, Claire, and their two sons. And I just want to add that in June, I went down to Santa Fe and um, spent a wonderful day with Henry, having breakfast and hiking around, <clears throat> visiting Mountain Cloud Zen Center, hiking around the property, and then having lunch. And we just chattered like a couple of magpies the whole time about everything under the sun. <clears throat> I just really was charmed by his kind of an innocent inquisitiveness and enthusiastic interest in just about everything. So, it's, uh, we, as Chris Hebard said, Chris lives in Santa Fe also, when he first met Henry, he thought, I want to be really good friends with this guy. And um, when I met Henry, I felt like we were good friends instantly. It was like one of those kind of resonance things. So, it's really great to be able to catch up with Henry and spend a couple hours talking with him. So, welcome, Henry. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show, Rick, and thank you for that lovely introduction. And I, too, had the same feeling when we met, you know, that there's a really nice uh, vibe of resonance that I felt between us. I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to spend this time with you now. But actually, can I do something without any more ado? I want to just say happy birthday. Uh, Rick had his birthday yesterday, and I'm, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to light the candle. This, this little piece of chocolate cake is for you, Rick. We had a retreat for a one-day retreat yesterday at Arzendo for people who work in trauma care, and our cook made a chocolate cake, and I, I sort of finagled a piece of it for you. <laughs> so I want to invite you to... Blow it out any way you'd like, and I'll join in your breath. Okay, one, two, three. Great, happy, happy birthday, Rick. Thank you. So shrink wrap it and send it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was my 70th yesterday. Well, I'm honored to be with you on, uh, at an auspicious time. Yeah. Okay, so... Oh, um, hey, hey, can what? I just add one thing to sure. your lovely intro? Mm -hmm. Actually... <clears throat> I've almost published nine books. Okay. There's another one coming out in three days' time. It's officially published. Oh, and what's the name of that? One Blade of Grass. Oh, that's the one I read. So that's the one you read? Yeah, yeah. I read the entire book, and I found it fascinating. And actually, it will be out by the time this interview is posted, so people will be able to find it on Amazon or whatever, and I'll have a link to it uh, on, the pay on your page on, on BatGap. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, and it was a very, I should add, I don't, without sounding too um, obsequious or whatever the word would be, that you are a professional writer. So it was, a, it was an interesting book to read. There are a lot of spiritual teachers who are not, they don't really have a writing background, but they have something to say and they write a book, but um, they're not as, often not as enjoyable to read as yours was. <laughs> well, thanks for reading it. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so... Usually the pattern we follow in these interviews is to just get to know the person a little bit rather than have them just begin to spout 
wisdom and platitudes. Rather, let's get to know your, your life story a little bit. So we kind of get a feeling for who you are and what you've been through. And then as it will naturally segue into all kinds of um, knowledge part, bits about Zen and all, whatever else we, we end up discussing. That sounds just great. Yeah. So give us a bit of your background. Well, let's see. I grew up in Oxford, England, the son of two uh, academics. And um, I had one of the significant things in my biography is that I had very severe eczema from, a, from an early age, from infancy. And, um, <clears throat> it, and for those who don't know, eczema is a skin condition. Yeah. Most it's, people it's, would know that. Yeah, it's very, it's actually something like 30 million or more Americans have it, actually. So it's much more widespread than one might imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's very painful and itchy. It itches a lot. So it was, it was, that was an issue for me, of course, and it took quite a long time to sort of grow out of it. It wasn't really until my mid to late 20s that I did, although it was intermittent. And, and what gradually. is the um, cause of eczema supposed to be? Well, it's, they call it, and this, the kind I had, they called atopic dermatitis. And that term atopic literally means placeless. But it means that it's, it's in a family with allergies and hay fever, asthma, and they, meaning that they, often people, members of the same family, will have one or more of those symptoms. And they don't really know. One of the problems is that it's not really clear. What, there are some forms that are clear, they're just allergic. But this atopic one actually isn't uh, by any means necessarily allergic. It's got lots of factors. It's, there are factors, though, because when I started meditating, it actually, that was when it really started to significantly improve. So there is known to be a stress factor, environmental factors. Um, but it led to a lot of stress. You know, yeah. Not, I mean, your so descriptions good. of it in the book are really... Um you know, graphic and quite horrific. It was, you know, not just some little itchy bit. You, you, you were kind of like, your skin was on fire for a good part of your, your youth. Yeah, it was, it was, it was like that. But there were, there were reprieves and relief, relief times, respites, you know. And so I had, when I grew up really in a very, you know, literary kind of world, and um, what seemed to be the most liberative sort of path within that world was poetry. I discovered that there were these amazing poets, basically from China, you know, way back in the Tang Dynasty, that's like 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth centuries, uh, who kind of were poets and wanderers. And I was just captivated by them. I loved their poetry. I loved the way they lived. And I mean, this was, you know, no discovery of mine, so to speak. You know, Ezra Pound translated a lot of them, and the Jack Kerouac read them. They were kind of known. And so we, I really got into this idea of being a kind of itinerant person who, who wrote appreciative things about the world. You know, I thought that, that's a really cool way to live. And I kind of tried to do it as a teenager. You know, we, with some friends who were also, one or two friends who were also into the same sort of thing, you know, we, we wandered around the valleys and hills in our, in our long school holidays and, you know, slept rough and, and it was, it was kind of interesting. And, and then I traveled as soon as I could, you know, when I was 18, 19, I went away on a gap year to work far away. And, um, and actually I had a sort of miraculous or felt miraculous relief from eczema then. It's just being skin. away. Yeah, you went to South yeah. America, as I recall. That's right. My skin just got better. It was the weirdest thing. Maybe it was diet in part, but I tried diet stuff before and it hadn't helped. So, and I tried diet stuff later because it came back when I went home. But it was while I was there that something else really significant in my biography happened to me, which is that one late afternoon towards the end of the trip, I was standing on my own on a little beach and I had a, a moment that to me was utterly bewildering. N now in hindsight and knowing what I do, it's not quite so strange, but it was a moment of really deep realization of, of, of awakening that suddenly just hit, came out of nowhere. I, I dropped away, my normal sense of self dropped away, and I found that I was completely 
intimate with the whole universe and part of it. And, you know, belonging had been a big issue for me, actually, because I, not only the eczema thing makes you not really feel at home in the world, but also I was from a half Jewish family. And, you know, my, my dad was Jewish, my mum wasn't. England in the 1970s was not really free of anti-Semitism. It sort of was outwardly. I mean, my dad had a position in a prestigious university. That it wasn't problems like that. But there was a kind of undercurrent of anti-Semitism, nevertheless, that you know you could pick up on. And I, I was never kind of clear whether I was was I English, was I Jewish. We were, you know, both our parents were at that time atheists, and we were at least we weren't brought up religiously. So there was no Jewish community. But they're also, you know, they didn't really fully belong in the world of England somehow. And so to find in this moment that I just belonged totally, you know, to, to the very heart of the universe kind of thing. I just belonged. It was, it was the most marvelous thing. And I, I felt um, utterly relieved of all my troubles and fulfilled, completely fulfilled. I felt like, you know, I could die that night, really, and my life would have been completely fulfilled. But a few weeks on, I was back home, and my eczema started coming back. All the unexamined difficulties of our, our parental, familial situation that I'd grown up in started to show themselves, I started to be more aware of them. And, and I, I became very unhappy, actually, so for several years. You and mentioned that when you went back home, you started having these crying episodes, which I guess were not normal for you before that. And um, I wondered whether perhaps the experience on the beach had loosened up some deep, you know, deeply rooted impressions in you and that they then began to sort of work themselves out and express yeah, them as crying, you think? I think that's exactly right. Yeah. But I had, I had no framework at that time for understanding um, emotional wounds. I didn't really know there were such things. So I just saw myself sort of falling apart and it was very scary. And I didn't really have any, I didn't know how to turn I didn't know that there might even be support. I thought I was just sort of losing it. And because that's how it felt to me. I mean, you know, in time, and it did take a bit of time, I found my way to some really helpful therapy. And I found my way to practice, to TM, which was my first meditation practice, which was tremendously helpful. Yeah. And began a, began a healing journey. And you yes, mentioned I that think you slept for a week after you learned TM. And I've heard that kind of thing before. It's like, <sighs> There's this huge relief and your body relaxes and all this storehouse of fatigue and stress that has accumulated just has to work itself out and you need to, you need to sleep a lot. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. And I, I had had no idea how ragged I was. You know, I, I felt I was just sort of struggling to live appropriately or something and do the things that were required of me. But in fact, I'd been running my nervous system raw with anxiety and, and pressure I was putting on myself and all kinds of stuff, you know. Yeah, you mentioned um, you would di maybe this was after South America and before TM, I'm not sure, but you mentioned a phase of knowing that there's more to life, but not knowing what it is, this sort of feeling. Yeah, like yeah. What, yeah. <laughs> well, I had that sort like of Like Richard that, Dreyfuss in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, you know, I'd had this strange and marvelous moment of liberation and i didn't and i didn't know what it was but right, i knew you didn't even put a spiritual label on it right no i knew it was real that's all i knew and i thought well why aren't i experiencing that now and i had a terrible sense of failure that i failed to live up to some gift that had fallen on me some gift of insight or discovery or something which i sort of in some way i felt i squandered i'd lost it i you know a lot of guilt and shame was in my makeup at that time. But yeah, so that, that meant, you know, I know there's more. I know there's something different. I know, um, I know that I'm not living 
I also actually, I might add, during those months away, I'd actually written my first book. And that was also quite a fulfilling thing to do and to have done. And, you know, I, I knew what creative fulfillment could feel like as well. And I certainly wasn't anywhere near that in those years. I was doing an a, a undergraduate degree, then a, a postgraduate degree that I really wasn't terribly interested in. And yet I kind of just could, you know, I was a young you know man do. problems. Yeah, well, I, did, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't yet ready to, you know, get a regular job. I was trying to uh, sort of see if I could somehow fulfill the promise that writing that early book had seemed to offer of really becoming a writer. But it was, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a difficult time. You mentioned, uh, I don't know where this fits into the chronology that you're telling us, but you mentioned, you said, I had a vivid daydream. An angel reached into my chest and pulled out a, a scowling homunculus and carried off the little demon as it screamed in frustration, exercised at last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I was actually at that time I was working for a company, a recording company, but I had just uh, recently started doing TM and I'd also fairly recently had the news that my first book had been picked up by a publisher. I was probably 25, 26 at the time. And yes, there was a tremendous sense of relief that somehow I was recalibrating, you know, my nervous system was recalibrating itself. I was coming back to some kind of homeostasis, some sort of balance in myself. It was just a huge relief. And it showed up in a kind of imagery that, that you just, you just yeah. read about. Uh, well, I actually take those things somewhat literally. Um, I think there was a story about um, Muhammad that he kind of got worked over by some kind of angels or something. And he was like, oh, afterwards, uh, you know, <laughs> and he became a different person and then ended up becoming this great spiritual teacher. Um, I know yes. That, yeah. I don't well, think I, it go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with you. I did several years of really deep dream work uh, later, uh, which was all about letting these, entering what, what some people have called the, the mundus imaginalis, the imaginal world, not, not um, imaginary, but imaginal, which is a kind of archetypal mythological realm where, you know, dreams are, animism is a shamanism probably takes us there. And in the dream work, we were, you know, encouraged to sort of let all kinds of figures really work us over, even kill us, actually. And it could be tremendously uh, cathartic and healing and beneficial. Um, so I'm familiar with that. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, actually, that there is that level where things that, things that aren't, you know, quite of the material world, but they're real. Yeah, as, as real as you and I are. They're just subtler. And they, they're kind of in different dimensions and so on. So um, I know some people think that's just hocus pocus, but um, from everything I've learned and experienced and, and talking to other people, I, you know, I just I think of it like an ocean where you're just going to find different kinds of fish swimming at different depths in the ocean, and and some of which could not possibly swim at a different depth. They, they you know, those those things that glow in the dark and live near the bottom would explode if they came to the surface, and the surface ones would die if they went too deep. They just it's natural for different life forms to live at different strata of creation, both in the ocean and in the larger creation. <clears throat> yes, yes, that's a lovely way to look at it. I mean, we sometimes say in the Zen tradition that there's sort of different levels of practice. And um, I don't know if I, I don't want to get too sort of teacherly. Yeah, go ahead. You know, but we some, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, there's I an old teacherly teacher you right back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it just it's very similar to what you've just been saying, you know, that we have different levels of practice. We have different dimensions of healing that we need to do and different, um, you know, one would be obviously personal psychology would be a, lots of people who come to our center and are coming for that. And um, I'd say, you know, that would be one common level where we want more peace. We want more equanimity. We want more uh, sort of 
yeah, just stability in our nervous system, less reactivity, um, and, and, and more interpersonal harmony and that sort of thing. And then, and then there would be a kind of depth psychology, as they call it, or transpersonal psychology level, where we are more into that archetypal realm, where we're putting ourselves in the way of sort of powers and entities and forces that may have all kinds of healing to bring us. And um, then there's another level in practice terms where we're really studying how the sense of self is created. You know, we're, we're teasing apart the various processes in present moment experience that, that we attribute, that we, that we identify with and we attribute selfhood to. And as we start to sort of discriminate, analyze and take them apart, we, we may start to see there really isn't the sense of self there that we thought there was. And then there's the, 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 the an even deeper level, which we would call awakening in the Zen tradition, where we, where we awaken to non-dual experience, where the sense of self drops away and suddenly we see we're inseparable for everything. And there's different dimensions to even that that might be interesting to talk about. But, but I mean, but the, the, the point I would want to make is that all of them are important. And that, um, I mean, for example, you know, I might look at my own biographies, biography and, and sort of say, well, in a certain way, my first major healing moment was actually on that level, it was a sudden discovery of, of unity with everything. But, but man, I had a lot of work to do on other levels. You know, and actually, I have more work to do, of course, on that level, too. In some ways, you don't have any work to do on it. But in some ways, actually, one can go deeper and deeper and further and further into awakening. And that's one thing that was so wonderful for me to find out about Zen when I eventually came to it. You know, I, I had, um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been looking for some, some way of sort of responding to that experience. You know, how, what, do you, what do I do after it? What do I do next? At the time, there'd been no need, of course. It was completely fulfilled in and of itself, and for a few weeks after. But after it had sort of faded, well, why, why has it faded? What do I do next? Then I went home and just had a, got completely sidetracked by really difficult personal you know, experiences, difficult times. And I really had to do some healing on that level before I could even begin to think about reapproaching whatever that moment had been. And it, it sort of happened to be kind of at the right time that I met a Zen practitioner who had a sort of radiance, a sort of subtle, quiet radiance about her that intrigued me. She was, she was another writer, actually, and a very serious Zen practitioner. And, and some, some, some people may know of her. She's called Natalie Goldberg. And I happened to meet her when I first came to New Mexico. I was working on my third book at the time. And she was very sort of kind to me, took me under her wing a bit. And, um, and she introduced me to the Zen master Dogen, who was a 13th century Zen master. And, and she started reading a bit of Dogen to me at one point. And it was incomprehensible. It was just, I just, I had no idea what this guy's talking about. <laughs> but as I sort of reflected on it a day or two later, it suddenly occurred to me that he was kind of talking, he must have been talking from that experience I'd had on the beach. It was the only way that what he was saying would make sense. And he wasn't talking about it. He was talking from it. So that was very exciting because it, it meant to me, first of all, there were other people who knew about it, which up to that point, I just hadn't realized. You know, I, I, you know, I knew that I hadn't gone crazy then. I knew that in some ways, it had been the most real and true thing I'd ever experienced. But I just, as I said, I didn't, I didn't know where to go from that. Didn't know where to turn. Suddenly there was this Japanese 13th century master who I just knew was, he knew of it and he was talking from it. So not only were there people who knew about it, but there were people who knew how to, inhabit it and sort of stay, in some ways stay there. So the next morning I, I got myself trained in Zen meditation. Now actually it wasn't very easy for me because I was so grateful to TM 
I'd been doing it four or five years by then. For, for it, all the good things that had started to start come into my life had come from really picking up the meditation. And but I just once I'd done one period of what they call zazen or sitting zen. And by the way, zen the word just really means something like meditative absorption. It, it means something like that. It comes from the Sanskrit dhyana. And um, once I'd done it, I just I just sort of knew I I've got to do this. And so I started I started doing that on a regular basis. And sure enough, you know, it turned out that there was a path, you know, what, beyond what I'd experienced on the beach as a 19 year old, there was more to discover. And not only that, but there was a way of the great work was sort of going further in it, but also integrating it into daily life so that it could actually start to be present all the time, which is which would which would had seemed well for a long time seemed totally impossible to me. Even when I was in Zen training, I thought there's no way. This is those rare moments. They're known as kensho in Zen, seeing your original reality or something like that, seeing your original nature. They're too. They're far too overwhelming. You couldn't possibly sort of inhabit them. And in a sense, that might be true, but. Gradually, gradually, we can come to feel, feel its sense, its, its presence all the time, and, just, and really to start living from that, rather than like having a sense that there's two realities. There's a kind of everyday ordinary reality, and there's a sort of awakened reality. Gradually, the wall between those two, through the training that we do, uh, can come down. And I, I, for me, that's been one of the, the great gifts of Zen, that there really is a path to integrating, deep awakening, you know, and, and, and being able to live from it and sort of know it all the time seems to me just the most amazing gift and just the amazing thing. I, mean, I'm, I, I wouldn't want really to be devoting my life to anything else now. By the way, I'm sorry, I'm rattling on, but by the way, I stopped writing for quite a while. When I got deeper in Zen, I just, it just was not right anymore. And, and only recently did I come around to accepting that I'd been right, sort of in the margins of my life over the last few years, started writing again, and that a book had formed. And that's what this recent book, this new book, this soon-to-be book, um, that's why that came about. I wanted to talk about the path I've been on. Yeah, good. Mm. Um, so let me just recapitulate some of that and maybe summarize a bit. So we talked about um, all sorts of different, we could say, therapeutic and other technologies of consciousness, we could call them, um, being appropriate for different people at different stages and all that. I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. So. You know, no one feels like, in fact, someone sent in a question asking uh, Deborah from Davis, California, said, do you believe that authentic Dharma can only be found and practiced within the Sambo Zen lineage? Um, oh. I, I would well, question, a, what, go ahead, what are you going to say to that? Uh, that's an easy one. Uh, of course not. Of course not. I think, you know, I would hope that the Sambo Zen lineage is a, is a genuine path you know, um, uh, among thousands. I wouldn't for a minute assume to say it was the only one. No I way. would take it farther out and say among trillions because there are probably trillions of planets in the universe that are at least as evolved as ours, which isn't saying much. And they, they probably have all kinds of different paths that we couldn't imagine. And, but it's yeah. the same ultimate reality, you know. I couldn't agree more. And, there, you know, there are, there are sutras that say that there are universes where the Dharma is taught exclusively by smell, by aromas and scents, and others where it's taught exclusively by color. That's and very others, interesting. You know, you know what? Um, it's, it's said that you can transcend through any of the senses, that you can imagine them being like spokes radiating out from a hub with the transcendent being the hub, and you can follow any spoke down to its 
down to the hub. Um, and so that would mean visual means or, or what would this olfactory or auditory mm -hmm. or and auditory actually is um, a, thinking as we ordinarily experience it is said to be a subtler aspect of the sense of hearing. Yes, and so yes. we're, you know, and so that's, we're, we're kind of more familiar with the subtle aspect of hearing than we are the subtle aspect of any of the other senses. And that's why a sort of a mantra type thing can, can be an easy meditation for anyone to learn. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, we would say, I mean, the Zen koans that we study in our lineage are often their sort of records of people coming to awakening, or their dialogues that triggered awakening, they're usually somewhere in them always there's awakening and it can be by various sense there's one koan where uh 16 people get in a in a hot tub together and they all awaken spontaneously <laughs> so the feel the <laughs> feeling of the, the water, warm water. <laughs> 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 but you know that, that sense of the tactile sense triggered it and um absolutely i mean we would one way that we could look at it is that every single phenomenon is um well one one teacher in our lineage an important uh, roshi in the lineage said you know imagine a ruler you know like in a classroom it's got it's got centimeters and inches yeah ruler centimeters inches and little markings you know half an inch quarter inch eight sixteenth thirty second all along all this information that's like the world of phenomena all these separate phenomena individuated phenomena and you turn over the ruler and it's blank and that's his meta one metaphor he used for awakening to infinite empty oneness that en and any phenomenon contains is a manifestation of infinite empty oneness and it, it's it's the infinite empty oneness is actually completely manifesting as that phenomenon whether it's a grain of rice or a you know, or a thought even, or a, or a touch on the skin, or a sound. Or, so when we awaken to, there's a famous story of a, of a Zen master who had tried his, a Chinese, old Chinese master, he tried to get somewhere in a monastery and hadn't, hadn't got anywhere in his practice, or felt he hadn't got anywhere. And he went off and became an itinerant laborer. He's called Kyogen. And at a certain point, he was sweeping, he was taking care of a shrine and he was sweeping out the yard and a little piece of tile got stuck in his broom and flicked up and hit against a bamboo stalk, you know, big Chinese bamboo. And it, as it knocked the bamboo, he heard that little tock, that little knock. And at that sound, everything fell away and he, wake, he awakened. And as he said, he found he saw his original face. And so I that, think that at the, when the time is ripe, anything can trigger it. You know, the the smell of a bus exhaust or whatever could be the could be the impetus. Exactly, exactly. For me, at that first experience, it was the sparkle of sunlight on the ocean. There you go. Yeah. Suddenly, it became inseparable. But when we become when we when we become inseparable from one phenomenon we're actually becoming inseparable from all phenomena because all phenomena share that same inseparability, that same infinite empty oneness. All phenomena share it. So, and of course that includes us. So when, when we become one with something in a moment like that, whatever it may be, we, we become one with everything. <laughs> yeah. I will refrain from telling the joke about the Buddhist monk who, buy, who goes who to buys a hot dog home. vendor. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's heard that joke. <laughs> but actually, there's a second part of the joke, which people may not have heard, which is that, you know, he hands the guy a 20 and um, isn't offered any change. He said, well, where's my change? And the hot dog vendor says, change has to come from within. <laughs> <laughs> But um, anyway, a couple of other things to recapitulate here. So we were talking about integration. Um, and, you know, I think that 
there's a lot, there's several factors with that. I mean, one, one thing we're talking about here is actually a, a neurophysiological transformation, not just a, a change in consciousness or something. The, the whole, I mean, they've done long-term studies on various types of meditation practitioners and they found that, you know, the structure and function of the brain changes profoundly over time, but not overnight. Um, so there has to be a neurophysiological integration and probably many, many other things. Any, any aspect of our life, um, you know, has to kind of come into line with the awakening consciousness that we you know we hope to culture um and if anything gets too out of line with other things then there can be very lopsided development which can actually turn out to be kind of dangerous yes i would agree with that entirely and i think i i fell foul of that as a young man and um the way i would see it now is that um you know we we keep doing gradual, gradual practice, gradual cultivation, you know, we keep at it and we'll have threshold moments where subterranean work has been sufficiently done kind of thing. We are not yet aware of it because it's been just under the surface somehow of our experience, but we've done enough work and suddenly we sort of, something drops away and things get clearer in a new way. And then we just have to do a whole lot more work again. I mean, you know, when, the way I, I, I experienced that in my long-term Zen training was that, you know, I was doing this koan study where you work week after week with a teacher working on these, there are these classic collections of koans. And, um, and you kind of, I mean, often I felt, um, often it was, you know, it was very nice, but not like huge revelatory moments, just kind of shift, little shifts and subtle shifts and things. But every so often, there would be something sort of bigger would kind of happen. And I'd sort of ah, see something new that I, I hadn't opened to before. But then that wasn't it yet, because for a long time, in spite of having some awakening experiences, I was still, you know, the old habit patterns were very much in force still. So practice could help but I would still oscillate between kind of basically one way of being, being caught by old patterns and so on, and another way of being where I was much freer and more open and more generally more loving, actually, and sort of kinder and more at peace, but sort of flip-flopping back and forth. And I didn't know that it was really possible for someone like me to ever get free of that in a significant way. And I, was, I, I just didn't believe that that was gonna happen for me. I could see that in some ways it had for my teachers. But somehow I thought, I'm, no, I'm just sort of too messed up. I, I, I'm, I, it's okay, I've got a lot of benefit from it, it's very nice, but I'm gonna be like this. And I hadn't imagined that something else could happen. There was a deeper kind of experience where um, it really did make a thorough, difference. I, everything fell away in one moment uh, on a retreat. The, this was at John's uh, Center in England, was it? Yes, that's yeah. right. Well, I was on a retreat with him at a, at a Catholic retreat center where we held retreats. But just, here's, a, I, here's a phrase you wrote about that. You said, it was, it was as if a flashbulb had gone off in my skull, and that's, and that's what it suddenly illuminated. No me. The idea of me had been just that, an idea. Now it had burst like a bubble. Well, actually, Rick, I'm sorry. Was that the wrong say, quote? Well, that was an earlier one. Earlier one, all right. <laughs> that, all was, right. that was one where, yeah, I had a very clear, strong sort of realization that I'd, I'd made myself up, you know. But that wasn't enough. You know, a year later, I was still kind of struggling with some of the some of the issues I still had. The, the moment I'm talking about was maybe a, some years later oh, okay. after that. And I, when One I was thing you ready, mentioned, which, which I found a little, little puzzling. I mean, you, you, you were writing, I was reading along your book and I'd gotten through quite a few chapters and you were doing really well. And then you somehow ended up on, the, on some beach in the Caribbean and you're doing cocaine, drinking and smoking and all that. And I thought, how could he do that after all that spiritual practice? I mean, did you sort of experience a major 
relapse or something or or was it just some little crazy phase you went through and then you well, worked the, well out of it again or what yeah no i think that was an example of when you know i'd had this experience of sort of of no me and it was it was wonderful but at that time i didn't have a teacher i didn't have a sangha i was i was just a meditator you know and and i didn't know i just didn't know how to integrate that and i was you know still working on being a successful writer or at least you know making my living from it and that took a lot of effort and a lot of fair amount of stress and and i i just didn't i just didn't know what to do next and and so i yeah i got sort of quite lost around that time and it was only a few years after that that i i started to realize i've got to have a teacher it's it's for me you know i'm sure that's not true for everybody but for me i just had to come under the sort of shelter of of a safe teacher you know I, and i was a very skeptical rebellious kind of guy who didn't really like teachers i didn't i didn't really want to be um entrusting myself to anybody a lot of you people know? don't you know a lot of people say well you should just be your own guru and the age of teachers is over and and all that stuff but i think what you're saying here is that for you at least and we can consider whether it might be more universal uh, having proper guidance could be a safeguard on the path you know prevent you from screwing up in various ways w- w- if you had the proper feedback and knowledge and so on yeah it certainly was for me it was it was invaluable when i finally was able to sort of accept somebody and trust them just enough to lead me further in practice and it wasn't it, it was it was definitely about not screwing up and not going astray and stuff but also about just knowing that there's more there's further to go so if you have a if you have a real awakening experience it's everything you know you you know it's all you've seen it all you've discovered it all it's, there's nothing left out you know there's nothing more if it's a real experience so how can there be more but actually there is it takes and it, uh, you'll only know that at least i only knew that from the guidance of teachers who'd been where i'd been and knew there was further to go and they were right and i like i said i never thought i'd get there but actually i was wrong there was a finally there was a moment when basically just everything vanished everything collapsed everything was gone not just the world was gone and somehow there's still a witness to it not just the self is gone and the world somehow still there but everything it was really like a death i think the only the best way i could frame it these days when i sort of think back to it was it was really like dying i mean i don't know i haven't died yet but <laughs> in that way not <laughs> and that was the thing was, in in the zendo in in england with john yes exactly that thing just yeah talk yeah. about that a little bit i mean it's worth describing you you stayed up all night and then you had this tremendous uh, shift and things were never the same since might be worth elaborating on that yeah well i mean i often stayed up all night on zen retreats <laughs> it, if it gets smooth and deep it's just such a joy to keep sitting you know um but anyway on one of these retreats yeah i um i was i was sitting through the night riding this lovely deep current of energy getting into very deep states and and then suddenly it was very very clear that you know that basically again no me at all there's seeing there's hearing there's breathing there's feeling now and again a thought but there's no one to whom they're happening they're just they're just arising and it's very very beautiful and they there's nothing in the middle that space in the middle where the presumed me would be sitting is just a space just a space you know so so beautiful and i went to see my teacher in the, the next day just to sort of check in with him and um and he just he just sort of sat with me a moment he said something and then i can't talk about it very clearly because everything was sort of annihilated there was just just nothing just nothing and i don't know what really happened but i sort of sort of 
I didn't black out. It wasn't like I sort of fainted or something. There was just nothing. And I kind of, as it were, came around on the floor of the room, lying down, crying and laughing, and, and sort of felt the world starting to sort of reform, great pieces of reality sort of moving around in a kind of, I don't know, multi-dimensional kaleidoscope, very strange. And then gradually sort of just everything emerged again. And it was, it was new. It was just totally new. It was, and everything, everything actually was, has been a little different ever since then. And, um, and, and there's, uh, that's, that's what changed everything for me. Do you still feel that there's no me? I don't really care anymore. Well, but you know, do you feel that? Care, caring or not caring, do you, do, you, do you still have, do you have any sense of a personal self? Yeah, sometimes it, it, it comes up a bit, you know? And, um, and I, 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 just, I just go, all I really care about is the vast beauty at the heart of each moment. The vast love that's creating the moment, always. So that it's 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 just such a marvel. But and you know, sometimes if if there's a sense of self, I don't really, I don't really. It might come for a bit, and then I sit and it's gone. And there's just a great openness and a great sense of of um, inclusiveness. Inclusive, this is a good word, because I get a little stuck on this whole sense of no self thing, um, or no sense of self thing. Um, I, I sometimes wonder, well, is it something I haven't experienced yet? Um, but on the other hand, um, yeah, it's always possible, Irene said. Um, <laughs> there's plenty I haven't experienced. Uh, but, or, or is it that I don't understand what people mean by it? Because if I whack my thumb with a hammer, it's happening. I'm, there's a... You know, I care about it more than I would care about whacking a stone with a hammer. Um, I, I feel it, there, and you don't feel it down there in New Mexico. There's, there's a sort of a, a localization of the experience, which, um, you know, I would rather avoid because <laughs> uh, of the pain. Um, so there, and yet on the, at the same time, I experience, perhaps even under those circumstances, but under ordinary circumstances, a level of, we could say, silence, which is impersonal, you know, which is not a me. Um, there's a sense of being no one, nowhere. And yet, at the same time, a sense of being everywhere. And it's still, at the same time, a sense of being, yeah, it's me. I'm right here. I'm doing this. I'm talking to you. Um, so there's kind of this multidimensional thing that, but I don't know if, if that's um, how that compares with these people who insist that all sense of a personal self has fallen away. I just, it's hard for me to understand exactly what they're experiencing. Yeah, well, I mean, you could, we could be, you know, here we are sitting and talking to each other. It's very, very nice, actually. I like it. I'm enjoying it very much. And there could be a great sense of space. There just isn't, isn't someone in that space. There is. There's just a great space. Yes. You know, and that's lovely. I mean, that might be a dimension of it. Maybe there's more than one way of experiencing no self. Sometimes you get hit with a hammer and there's no reaction. There's no self reacting to it. There's pain and it's not a problem. Sometimes that can be the case. And, you know, so there's, and sometimes we have, I don't know, I, I feel um, there's a great famous Zen master called Rinzai. Yes, who, I who, you know, and he said of his teaching, he said, um, sometimes, what do you say? Sometimes I, I take away the person and I leave the world. Sometimes I take away the world and leave the person. Sometimes I take away both the world and the person. And sometimes I leave both the person and the world. Yeah, that makes sense and they're to all, me. And they're all good. So it just goes through different phases where one or another quality is predominant. Yes, yes. And, you know, he might have been talking about realization experiences that, that make a big difference. Yeah, you know, um, but, I think he could also have end, been talking about just going through a normal day and, you know, some things move to the forefront and, and others to the back according to what the circumstances demand or yes, elicit. Ex exactly. I think a, a great flexibility about it is, is healthy. 
And, you know, and th there's a danger of people getting stuck on, I don't have a self. And then they're actually doing things sort of that they're, you know, that would, would seem to suggest they do. You know? Yeah. That we've seen that a lot in spiritual communities. And so I, I think um, a level of humility about it is, is uh, really smart. And I don't, I mean, for, I, I don't feel my training is over. Uh, it's ongoing. And I'm very happy that I'm part of a lineage that keeps checking up on its teachers. Every year we gather for a teacher's retreat. You know, now we're all, we're all accountable and answerable to that. And I think there's a, you know, the, there is a risk of sort of being, t you know, well, almost attached to no self. You know, that's, self can creep in in all kinds of subtle ways. Yeah, there's, um, I have like eight pages of notes here and I can't just pop to the thing. That, but there was something in your notes where you talked about um, not, kind of rigidly glomming on to any particular perspective. It was, I think it was in the epilogue log where you went through about seven different concluding, concluding points. And one of them had to do with not fixating on any one particular perspective. Do you remember that? Well, I know that I feel that way because I felt that one of the things I love about being in, in, in a practice, you know, is that things keep changing. That, I, you know, I'll, 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 I'll have some sort of, minor experience or shift. I said, ah, yeah, 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 this is how it is. This is how it is. And 10 days later, no, it's something totally different. And when I'm really practicing well, there just isn't a place to stay. You know, there isn't a sort of fixed viewpoint to stay in at all. It just, it's just one ongoing marvel of arising and passing and changing. Just constant change here and now. That's sort of deeply exhilarating and, and full of a kind of love. It's sort of, I feel love is a key ingredient for me of the whole thing. Even though I'm talking about this, you know, nothing, that might sound really nihilistic, but it's not. It's, it's the most amazing thing. I actually used to be quite nihilistic. You know, I'd get depression now and then. After that experience, it sort of blew out my nihilism. It was like sort of dropping into nothing exploded all nihilism. It's a paradox. Almost. Interesting. But it seems very clear to me that that would be the case because thereafter, really, everything's being born. Now, now, now. For a long time, I felt that that moment didn't stop. It was just always right here. And, and now I've sort of, I think I've gone beyond that now, finally moved beyond. And I feel that every moment is its own universe. Just arising, arising, arising. Am I always keenly aware of that? No. Uh, but it's kind of, if I remember, I can usually tune into that at the drop of a hat. And, I don't and think just, you need to be always keenly aware of it. It's sort of like, you know, I mean, for instance, some people seem to feel or talk as though they think that remembering awareness all the time is going to somehow help to retain it, you know, pure awareness. Uh, but I think that it gets really rooted in your neurophysiology to, to the extent that you don't have to think about it and thinking about it is not going to help you retain it. It might actually divide the mind. Kind of like you take a shower in the morning, you don't have to think about how clean you are all day long in order to enjoy the benefits of the shower. They're, it's just kind of automatic. Um, yes, I could. I totally agree. And that would be very consistent with what Zen is trying to take us towards, you know, state where, well, one master, he said it's like, I know this is another metaphor. He talked about we, we're living in a room made of opaque glass. And when we have a moment of Kensho or awakening, it's like a hole is knocked through one of the walls of that glass room. And more light comes in and and then we start doing, after that, we can start doing koan training because the koans are all, you sort of have to have had a glimpse to, to do koans. And so after that, we might start koan training. And at a certain point, we, we'll, we'll be enlarging that hole or we, maybe we blow out another hole or there's a little hole made, a little, various little holes in this wall. And gradually the, the wall, the glass walls are getting a little bit lighter and lighter. 
And there can come a time where there's been enough holes blasted through these walls that they lose their structural integrity and they fall down. And at that point, we realize that the world sort of of awakening, the world of infinite empty oneness, and this ordinary everyday world, the world that we had thought of as the world of deluded living, you know, dualistic living, we realize that they, they've never been separate. And that, that's what I think is the great blessing. So we don't have to worry about a thing. We don't have to try to be too much, too spiritual. We don't have to try to be awakened. No, we just, this is it. Just this be natural. It. Just be natural. It's all, this is it, here, yeah. now. There's yeah. nothing more. It's a marvel. This, this is all. It's as natural as breathing. I mean, you know, you exactly. don't have to, that takes care of itself. The heart beats automatically. You don't exactly. have to attend to those things. So, you know. That's so, right. And so it's a little paradoxical because on the one hand, practice has its value and it does produce these incremental changes in, the, in, in our whole makeup phys, phys, physiologically and psychologically and everything else. Um, but the changes as they get integrated, we've talked about integration, um, become more and more and more stable and it just becomes more second nature to, to function in a way that we could previously only have a glimpse of under certain special conditions, eventually it just becomes a continuum under any conditions. Exactly. I'm very, I couldn't agree with you more. One thing we might add to that is our, our orientation can really change. That might be one of the things that is different, is that we, we're no, I mean, uh, to, to the best of my humble ability, I'm much less concerned with Henry, actually, <laughs> than I used to be. Yeah. I used to be very much more caught up. I mean, I've got a long way to go, I'm sure, and I hope I'm humble about it, but I'm trying, much more of my life seems to be, uh, much more of my energy and time seems to be happily expended toward the well-being of others now. And I'm really not so caught up in, in Henry's I, 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 I'm learning actually that I have to take care of myself. I think I had a few years where I, I didn't really think about myself at all and, and started to get a bit, um, a bit unbalanced and tired. Yeah, yeah. And I'm trying to correct that now. And uh -huh. um, so to do enough self care. Yeah. But it's really, but only so that I can really be helping others effectively, you know. And I'm, I'm, I think that, that would be another side of no self. Just are we are we working for ourselves? Are we working? For, is it more important and, and really joyous to be, you know, working on behalf of others? Seems just seems so much more the right thing to do. Yeah. So the, we we won't be seeing you establish Henryanity anytime soon. Uh, Henry what? Henryanity. You know, like Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the nice things about being in a lineage as well, is that, you know, it's not, it's not my teaching. Yeah, you know, that's I'm, important. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to manifest it in Henry's way, but it's not coming from Henry. What you're saying here is very relevant, I think, to this topic of no self. Um, it's more like we, we shift more and more to a perspective where we are kind of a, a sense organ and an, an organ of action of the infinite rather than just being a sort of a, a, a bound, isolated, in, you know, unit that's just sort of functioning um, independent of the totality. You know what I mean? And so there's a sense of that more and more I think we shift to not really holding the reins of the chariot, but something bigger holding the reins. And uh, we're just sort of along for the ride, serving in whatever way we're designed to serve. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I aspire to that. You know, in, in our Zen tradition, we talk about the, the Bodhisattva Kanzeon, who's a sort of, sort of great compassion, great compassionate force in the world, so to speak, and that we, we aspire to becoming Kanzeon's agents, Kanzeon's hands and eyes, you know, to, to responding where there's need, the, the way that is appropriate for us to do. We'd aspire to that. Um, 
A question just came in that kind of relates to what we're talking about in terms of heart and, and service and <clears throat> selflessness and, and all that. And in fact, just coincidentally, there is that term seva in Sanskrit, which means selfless service. And you, you serve in a way that sort of <clears throat> puts aside your individual cares and concerns and enables you to <clears throat> practice being a, an agent of something bigger. But a question came in from Jeff Hunt from Tulsa, Oklahoma, who asks, Henry, um, if Jeff Hunt, if you remember me, uh, some people think of Zen and Zen practice as a bit cold, but you don't describe it that way. Do you feel that specific heart practice is helpful? I just find myself at times almost on the verge of tears, but it doesn't feel bad. It feels right. And I wonder about a deliberate attempt at cultivation of the heart. Well, I'm sure that's a good idea. I, I mean, I, I got, I, I, I understand what Jeff's talking about. Hi, Jeff. And um, the, um, my own first impression of Zen was rather forbidding and something rather forbidding and kind of cold. And yeah, I found wild it a bit stories in Zen about people cutting their arms off in order to prove their, or that guy who cut his eyelids off. I mean, these characters who were not, you know, like warm, fuzzy guys. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know. I mean, they're, they're exactly, yeah, well, we could go into that, but I, I, I quite agree. And it could, and, you know, just going into a zendo can be quite austere. A austere, yeah, but austere. beautiful. And, well, it is beautiful. And I, I felt, I sort of, somehow, something clicked early on. I was going to this Zen monastery. I was always scared when I went there. And I'd, I'd, my heart would sink when I walked up the driveway and for retreats and stuff. But at some point, I, I just, I don't know, luckily found that underneath the formality, all it was was a warm heart. And when I found that in myself, I found it in it. And I realized that this is what this is for. So I just got lucky there. But having said that, I mean, I did, um, you know, like I said, the dream work that I did was, I mean, I cried gallons of tears through that dream work, all kinds of heart healing went on and heart opening went on that, you know, uh, this was while I was in a deep Zen training. So it, I don't feel, I think multiple valences are a good idea for some of us and having kind of, you know, outriggers to the main hull of our practice in life, if you, if you see what I mean, can be really helpful. So we've got to, you know, we may feel that our main practice is X, but we need an outrigger you know, for a while on our, on our whole. I think it's a really good idea. So, and I think um, it's true that Zen and actually generally Mahayana practices don't do a whole lot of um, cultivating loving kindness that you find in, for example, Vipassana and Theravada Buddhist practice. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all good. I think there's, there's nothing wrong with doing that at all. I think if we, we should do whatever opens our hearts, See, I, uh, something I haven't really said very clearly um, that I would like to, maybe this is the moment to, if it's okay. It's just, it's just that it, it's all about love. The whole thing is about love. I was talking about those levels earlier. You know, you could look at them as from the perspective of love. The first level, that psychological, is self-love. It's opening up how to love ourselves. Many of us need that. You know, we've lived with shame. We live with all kinds of... Um, you know, oppressive ideas of what we need to be, how we got to how we got to prove ourselves. Many, you know, other people have different issues and a lot of anxiety and stuff. When we when we see those patterns and from a clear perspective, you know, pain is painful to realize that's how we've been living, and it should melt the heart. And when they're really started to heal, we know it because we feel a wave of self love. A flood of self-love comes up. I can love this being. You know, of course I must love this being, really. It's my responsibility to love this being. And that will affect how we interact with others and more love for them. If we get into the archetypal level, um, and which I know best from dream work, some amount of shamanic work, you know, these, it's always about, you know, entities that are trying to love us. You know, and there may be some that aren't, that we need to get disengaged from. But... We're looking for the ones that are bringing love, a greater love, a bigger love. And if we get down to, um, you know, the sort of dismantling the self level of practice, you know, seeing 
the light starts to break in, the love starts to break in, the disidentifying starts to happen, and that opens up love. And if we get down right down to awakening, I mean, for many, awakening an experience will be that of experience of a great oneness, and a oneness that is all, that we're part of. And that's, that's a tremendous feeling of love that that brings. And then if you go, you know, from Zen view might be that you can go deeper than that to this, this zero, this absolute zero. But that absolute zero is giving everything. It's when we find it as an experience, not so much as an idea, but as an experience, we know it's giving everything. It's just, it's, it's one generosity, one infinite, boundless generosity. And that is an overwhelming love, you know. And so I think my takeaway from my practice thus far is that it's always about love. Hmm. You know, that line from the 23rd Psalm, my cup runneth over. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that there, it's a beautiful metaphor, but I, I think that at a certain point we we're, we're quite full and we start to over, run over <laughs> to, you know, the, the love inside or the bliss inside starts to just spill over through everything we do. Um, yes. Yeah. And it can be very effective at changing circumstances in the world without actually having to tinker with the circumstances specifically. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I have this fanatic, fanatical obsession with pickleball. <laughs> I've mentioned it in some of my interviews. So there was a situation where someone organized a sort of a group of people to play pickleball together and excluded me because, I don't know, they didn't like me or they didn't like the way I played or something else. But I felt like I would really fit into that group based upon my particular skill level. And I, th I, I was tempted to say something to her or do something like that. You know, I was, I was feeling kind of grumbly about it. But I thought, no. I'm just going to feel love for this person and appreciation. And if I actually do interact with her, be very, you know, just be friendly and, and normal and not resentful in any way. And sure enough, after a while, it's like, hey, Rick, would you like to join this group? You know, it just sort of, <laughs> it just kind of came around. Well, I'm very happy for you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And for them. But, you know, yes, I mean, I think this, uh, oh man, this feeling when, this is another aspect of no self, the less self, the more that original love just wells up and wells up, and the self, there's no self to get in its way. Yeah, Lord, may, let me be an instrument of thy peace, St. Francis, yes. um, may, yes. or make me an instrument of thy peace. Good. So, uh, oh, go ahead, continue. No, no, well, I was just going to say somehow I wanted to just touch on the koans again because they're all, they're all helping us to come back to this boundlessness that is boundlessly giving and boundlessly loving. And, and um, they, they're very interesting, actually, because they, well, at least I find them fascinating, but they're, they're little tiny anecdotes of things that were said or done or both by very deeply enlightened masters, mostly from Tang Dynasty China, which was that very period of the wandering poets I was talking about earlier. That was an amazing period of, ta of Chinese history when it was very, when it was uh, awakening was sort of deep in the, in the spirit of the society at that time. It was sort of a, a known thing. The Zen masters, Zen monasteries were flourishing. They were called Chan in the Chinese terminology. But yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, to, to give us some examples, like we've all heard the sound of one hand clapping, or does a dog have Buddha nature, or what was your original face before your parents were born? Those are, to my recollection, some examples of koans, just so people know what you're talking about. Yes, yes, exactly right. And another famous one would be, what is Buddha? And the master answers, dried shit stick. <laughs> 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 and they used to use a, they called it a shit stick in the medieval Chinese privy. Yeah, they to clean it out or something? To clean, or? To clean themselves. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. to clean themselves. Uh, yeah, I yeah. Hmm. So I shouldn't, shouldn't think a stick would be very effective, but go on. <laughs> we don't need to go into the details of that. <laughs> <laughs> they said, what is Buddha? What is, what is, you know, what is the deepest reality? You know, answer, 
shit stick. Huh. So, so what do you do with that? If, if, if you're going to work on that Cohen, how do you work on yeah, it? And how yeah, does it good, actually help? Good question. Well, what you do is you, it's a little bit mantra-like, or can be. You take it into your practice, into your sitting, and you just repeat it. And you might repeat it <laughs> a few times, <laughs> yeah. or you might, and, and then sort of drop it and just sit in a sort of general open awareness. Or you might, um, you might work on it more assiduously, just you keep working on it. Keep it. And Cohen's have this amazing ability to sort of, to, to open us up. And, and, and we'll, we'll have what's, what's initially sort of just nonsensical, meaningless thing to be doing at a certain point sooner or later, will become really, it'll open up a beautiful sense of expansiveness and a sort of re, uh, our, our, our sense of what we are becoming vast. It, it may become like that, you know. And the, somehow this strange little phrase is at the heart of that and is kind of holding all of that. And, 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 but then we have to go to the teacher with a kind and we have to do this even stranger thing that we call presenting the koan. We have to do something. And the, and, uh, and the koan, each one, has a particular traditional presentation, a, a thing it makes us do. But the, the, there's, there's some that have multiple presentations, but typically there's one. And, you know, it, it just comes bubbling up that we sort of do something. And when we do it in front of the teacher, you know, there's an incredible kind of connection and sort of opening together through the koan. That happens. So do you end up coming up with a, an answer that you can explain? Like, what was the question on that one? What is the Buddha or something? Yeah, what is a Buddha? All right. So, I mean, if I were to logically think about that and, and you know, and I think, okay, well, ultimately a dried shit stick, which is one of the most, you know, kind of a, an example of something um, offensive that we wouldn't really want to have much ex- proximity to, um, is the same ultimate Buddhahood or reality or, you know, uh, pure consciousness or whatever that everything else is. And so, so if you can see it in that, you can see it in everything. I mean, w- or is that the way you would come, you would present it? Or is that like too intellectual or... Well, that might be that might be a way we might explain it, and that that's you're sort of you're onto it. But but there's still this key piece. The first thing we have to do when we meet is present it, and that is is a, it's a dynamic, gestural, you know, sometimes verbal, but it's sort of it's non-conceptual. It's a sort of it's a thing that the koan makes us do, that brings the koan to life. The koan wants to sort of live in us and use us to present itself. You, so you could almost say it that way. Maybe that sounds a bit strange. But they, but they basically, because they have a presentation, they're sort of bypassing the conceptual faculty. And uh, that's maybe we, we would, we might say that by doing that time and time again with many different koans, all of the, from the lives of these enlightened masters, maybe that is how the awakening that we've already had in order to be able to do any koans, that awakening is starting to permeate our being in a non-intellectual way. And so, and, 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 and so you know, it's, that's how it's sort of growing in us to the point where it may ultimately become um, pervasive. So different ones enliven different channels, you could say, or different faculties that might be latent and could be enlivened or yeah i think yeah. i think so and they they're coming all each one is is a sort of whole universe and each one is its own perspective on it kind of reminds the, me of the yoga sutras of patanjali where there's all these different sutras and they're and you're supposed to do sanyama on them which is dharana dhyan and samadhi together and it um said to sort of enliven different facets of of your your makeup and culture different qualities or abilities. Yes, it might be analogous to that. Yes. 
Interesting. Mm. There's a couple of things we've been talking about that I want to loop back to. Um, but first, here's a nice question from Michelle Ram- Ramaro from Keene, New Hampshire. Hi, Henry. Um, what do you advise when one has a perceptual shift slash glimpse slash opening, wherein there is a shift from me to the experience of a direct witnessing slash knowing that was present briefly, leaving a sense of grief slash loss after it left. A lot of slashes here. How to integrate without grasping while being aware that energetic changes continue to unfold? That's a beautiful question. I sort of, I can resonate with that. Mm -hmm. You kind of Um, described something like that already in your own own experience. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I'm the first thing I think is trust the, trust the yearning, trust the sense of loss, trust the grief. I would weep now. I would just cry, and I just trust the process. To you know, this this never absent. What that that beautiful witnessing consciousness that's not so personally uh, identified or so personally concentrated or even cons- constrained is more. It's, it's, a, it's a loving witnessing per consciousness or awareness. I mean, that's always here. So, so how can we trust when we only taste it, or how marvelous it is, how relieving it is, but it's, then it's gone. Trust that it's always here and that you're in a process and that the grieving and the yearning for it is part of the process. And then you just have to trust what what shows up in your life that might offer guidance. You know, and, and some people, I don't know what to say about practice. I'm not, uh, you know, for me, it's been about practice. Practice has been an arena in which so much could take place. I mean, practice by practice, I mean, formal meditation practice has been a kind of, yeah, sort of zone, um, a stage or so, yeah, an arena where all kinds of growth could happen that probably I don't think, for me, would be as likely to have happened had I not taken up formal, regular practice. And ultimately, that was formal, regular practice with guidance, very ongoing guidance, and with community. And so, but I know that that's not what everybody is drawn to, and it's not what everybody needs. I must say, I wasn't particularly drawn to it myself, but I really needed it. And so, you know, uh, Michelle might look for opportunities for practice in, in with, I mean, the old Buddhist formula is that you need three things, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Sangha is community, Dharma is teaching, and Buddha is, well, perhaps it's your meditation practice. It can come to mean other things. So not everybody, I'm sure, would feel they do need all those three things. But, but if, you, if you, you know, you could explore it. The main thing is trust it. Trust what happened to you. Trust the grief. Trust the yearning that is in there. And, and don't worry too much. It's okay. It's something real happened. Did you ever read Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, Outliers? Was, yes, I think I did. That was where he talked about like, ice 10, hockey players. Hours. Oh, 10,000 hours. You know, <laughs> Bill Gates, the Beatles. Yeah. He, he gave several examples of people who had excelled in their field and he he you know discussed how they had put in at least 10,000 hours of practice um, to get that good yes 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 i know yeah yeah i think that's probably true you know i don't know you you might you might well agree with me you've probably done more than 10,000 hours i'm sure rick you've done you've been meditating at least as long as I have, probably longer. Yeah. I don't know, maybe two, longer. Two or three hours a day for 51 years. I, I could sort of do the math of how yeah. many hours that is. <laughs> I don't know. It's a goodly but amount. I think yeah. I figured it out once it was about six years with my eyes closed. If you add it up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Time well spent. Um, I wanted to, a few things I wanted to loop back to. One, we were talking about the blossoming of love and, and devotion and, and, and my cup runneth over. I think that there are different, you would agree with this, I think that there are different degrees or stages of awakening, perhaps many of them. And I think many of them may correspond to different faculties. Um, so, for instance, you know, there could be a, an awakening that kind of, if we think in terms of chakras, there could be one that corresponds to the, the head, you know, the head chakra and then maybe the intellect or whatever. And there could be another 
maybe later on or maybe before, I don't know, which corresponds to the heart chakra. So there are these different sort of areas of our makeup that um, could predominate in terms of their enlivenment when one or another degree of awakening or stage of awakening occurs. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think, you know, in Zen, we're a little sparing. I haven't been today, but typically we're a bit sparing with the term awakening. And so I, I would understand it more easily as different levels of, re- of realizing stuff and releasing stuff that happens on different levels. Like to do, um, I don't know whether this is quite in, on track with what you're talking about, but for example, cognitive therapy can be very helpful at a certain time for certain people where they really track how they're thinking and how they're generating, you know, difficult feelings through the way they're thinking. And to see that we've been doing that, to see that, wow, this voice has been running in my mind saying these things and to be able to disengage from that, uh, you know, is very helpful for, for people in, in doing cognitive behavior therapy, for example. So that would be a moment of sort of realizing a pattern that has been going on and releasing it. And that's a kind of, kind of analogous to awakening. You know, and, and then all the, the, the work, the emotional and heart work uh, that, that we've touched on a little bit, you know, that could be analogous that you see, wow, there's this, there's this emotion that I just keep playing in my, in my nervous system. I don't have to. How interesting, you know, I can just release it. And that's, that, that can be, you know, very important thing to to discover and is it awakening i I may not be on track with what you were saying actually but for that's not quite but it's useful okay (laughs) that would that for us would not be quite awakening awakening is fairly limited in the zen view to to this sort of dropping away of self enough to taste infinite empty oneness Meaning we, we may be more on the oneness side, more on the empty side, more on the infinite side in any one experience. And well, some... there are tastes, and then perhaps there's a continuum. I mean, I presume that, uh, you know, we, you, you hear, there's all sorts of Zen stories about this or that happening, and then the person gets enlightened, if we want to use that word, or they awaken, presumably in a stable way, which they don't lose again. So... Maybe I should ask, um, you know, how do, does Zen or how do you define enlightenment? Is there any sort of ultimate? I mean, let's say the Buddha was the ultimate example of enlightenment. Um, did the Buddha, how would you define his state? And presumably Zen students aspire to that. And do you think the Buddha was still evolving or growing in some way after his enlightenment and the, that enlightenment for him was a, a very significant milestone, but not the end of the journey? Well, there is a saying in Zen that Shakyamuni Buddha himself is still practicing and still only halfway there. Interesting. I think during his actual lifetime, he continued to practice, or so I heard. Yes, I think that's right. And um, I mean, we, we, we could, there's a helpful map in Zen known as the ox herding pictures. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, you, you know, the, the, I won't go through all of them, you know, but the, there's 10 of them. But the third one is called Seeing the Ox. And we consider that to be a moment of awakening where you see this sort of other, other dimension or, or m- multiple dimensions, which, which is, you know, as I've been saying, infinite, empty, one, and it's right here. And it's, and it's you know, it's bound, the boundlessness is right here. So we have a sudden taste of that, sudden glimpse of that, maybe stronger than taste or glimpse. We really drop into it. And, but, but it's sort of, fades or we could have recongealed from that afterwards as a, as a self. But we know we've seen it. We now know the ox is real. There's really a live animal out there. We haven't seen the whole ox, but we've seen a bit of it. And, and then the fourth ox herding picture is catching the ox. And that's when, you know, it doesn't have to go away anymore. And um, that would be, in our view, in the, the, the Zen that I've been trained in, is quite a big difference from the third picture to the fourth observing picture. That's a, usually a lot of training. In decades. <laughs> uh, yeah, typically, yes. You know, 
And that's what we sort of think koan training is for. It could take you from the third picture where you've had a glimpse to the fourth where it's more stable. But then it goes on, there's, that's only the fourth of ten stages. There's, there's five, six more sort of basically getting more and more refined and more and more um, ultimately to, to, to forget about it, actually. Well, not even ultimately, but that's sort of like the seventh picture, I mean. You just forget about it. It's just or blank. The eighth picture. Yeah, that's, that's the eighth one, actually. Yeah, just blank. You know? And then, and then you, the, the hope is to come back to the marketplace, so-called, with gift-bestowing hands. Riding the ox. Riding the ox is a little bit earlier. Oh, uh, okay. they're all, they've all got nice things to them. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> but, yeah, but, you know, the, to, to, um, to be able to... Um, they, they always talk about this in Zen. You, you've got to wash it away. A little bit like you were saying earlier. The, the, we want to have, we, we've got to work at it. And we've got to do our training. This is Zen view. And, and it can come to the point where an absolute, you know, various milestones, but there could be one milestone where it's, it's we're, we're, we're okay. That we're over the hump. We're, we're not going back. It's, we're free. We're significantly free. There may still be traces of habit patterns and all kinds of stuff that comes up, but it doesn't really dent it. We're, something's done now. What had to be done has been done, as Buddha put it somewhere. That we can really have that as normal people in the 21st century. We can really have that. And even troubled, you know, pretty messed up people like me can have that. It's actually possible. It's not. Uh, it's not an unrealistic aspiration, but it's not usually very quick. You know, it usually takes an awful lot of work. Some people are lucky and it takes less. And, you know, some people have a third ox herning picture glimpse easily, young, early in life. Uh, perhaps that was me. But then look at all the work. I mean, years and years, decades of work before something truly lastingly helpful really could happen, you know? And um, have I gone off topic? What did you ask No, that me? was good. I think we covered that. I have some more questions. Okay. One question that's a little, we'll just, we don't have to dwell on this very long, but I was just curious. You told me when we, I was down in New Mexico that you actually still do TM every day, at least once, in addition to your Zen practice. And I was just curious, what do you feel you derive from that that you don't derive from Zen practice and vice versa? Actually, Rick, I'm sorry, that was true then, but it's not true now. Oh, okay. okay. I, 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 you did that I for a while. I, yeah, I'll have little phases where I might do it once a day. I'm a very bad TM person. I'm sorry. Oh, see, I feel... That was true in June, you mean, but not now. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Well, no I, haven't been, I, don't, I, haven't I don't care been... whether you do it or not. I was just wondering <laughs> what you felt you got from it the, <laughs> and vice uh, versa. Well, I'll tell you, to be perfectly honest, I find it's really helpful with jet lag. Jet lag, you know, okay. I, I fly to Europe three times a year to teach. Yeah. And um, I actually really, really like picking up some TM around flight, transcontinental, whatever, flying. I still find, you know, TM can be um, immediately relaxing. Yes. In a way that some of my other practices can be, but are not so predictably. Okay, good. We don't have to go into that anymore. I just was wondering. Um, here's another little wrap-up point that we touched on I want to go into more deeply. Um, we were talking about perspectives and views and so on, and there's a, a bit from your book here where you said, it means that we can't hold any views at all. We can't even hold the view that we have no views. Plato said, destroy all hypotheses. Um, so I wonder if we... Re for, I don't have a problem with hypotheses if I define hypotheses as sort of ideas that I am still exploring and learning about that I haven't reached any firm conclusions about and that may never do so in the same sense that science uses the term, you know. Um, hypotheses don't become theories until they um, have accumulated a lot of evidence and even theories are subject to um, refutation if, if conf anomalies are, are discovered. So, um, and I mean, you must have views, 
right? Like you'd, you would rather your sons get a good education than become drug dealers or something like that. That's a view. So what, what is really meant by that little couple of sentences that I read there? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I mean, maybe that was a view in itself <laughs> <laughs> um, that I was expressing there that I wouldn't necessarily agree with now. I, I think in a practical meaning, in the level of practice, um, to have to be willing to not know, to let go of opinions is so beautiful. To not be and not sure of yourself. Yeah, yeah. And just, you know, in the moment, you know, just to let go of knowing here and now. It opens, it's a, maybe it's another aspect of the no self thing that we were discussing earlier. When I do just, just stop knowing, uh, it's, and, and it's, it's beautiful. The world opens up. The moment expands. There's a, there's a great hollow that is very somehow full of love in the middle of this moment when we stop knowing. So I see it, maybe we could think of it as a, as a, as a, as a practice-based thing, that just to be able to come back to that. And from that, of course, no problem with positing this, positing that, exploring this, exploring that. Let's explore this idea. It looks quite interesting. But actually to be always able to return at the drop of a hat to not knowing. So they're beautiful. In, 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 in Buddhism, they call it prajna, which, you know, is the word for wisdom. But um, uh, some teachers uh, parse that out as meaning before knowing. The real wisdom is, is before we know anything, sort of pre, pre-dating everything, and, but right here, yeah. right in this moment. I think it's humility, really, the, the quality of not insisting that things happen any particular way or that you know things for absolute certain and that nothing could, um, so could upend the, your, your certainty, you know, your knowledge. I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, it's funny you say that because I was going to go on to say how much that opens up humility. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and the humility, I feel, is a sort of, well, cornerstone or something of the whole thing. Because when there's humility, it's only a short step to huge gratitude. And when there's gratitude, it's only a huge, small, tiny step to compassion. You know, and I think somehow those three are a kind of holy triad in practice, humility, gratitude, compassion. Nice. And they, uh, you know, I think in Zen, they're just, they're crucial. Another thing I want to get into with you is um, we were talking about emptiness a little while ago, you know, and that word comes up a lot, nothingness, emptiness, and so on. And in the, in the Vedic tradition, they, they kind of look at it both ways. They, they say, yes, it could be seen as emptiness, shunyavada, or it could be seen as fullness, purnavada. And um, when you think about the fecundity of, of uh, you know, creation, the, the huge explosion of creativity and, and, you know, variety and diversity and complexity and so on, it's a little hard to think of that coming out of nothing. Although there too, there was an Upanishadic story where, uh, you know, the, the teacher tells the student to go and get him a, what was it, a, some kind of a nut or something, and, and then to, uh, to bring it to him and he brings it, he said, now crack it open, and he cracks it open, he said, well, what do you see inside? Nothing. And so the whole, the whole banyan seed, that was it, a banyan seed. So the, this whole banyan tree, a vast tree, comes out of that nothingness. So you can kind of flip back and forth. Uh, physics says that in, in a cubic centimeter of empty space, there's more energy than there is in the entire manifest universe. There, there, so there's an example of fullness, and yet there's nothing there. So there's an example of emptiness. Uh, so it's interesting to play with. Well, look, I think you've said it so beautifully. I, I mean, I'd agree with all of that. And... Um, because this experience of emptiness is also an experience of just utter completeness and utter fullness. And as I was saying earlier, utter generosity. It's sort of, so that emptiness is a terrible word, actually. It's a really misleading word. And I was using the word nothing earlier. That also is a totally misleading word. It's true in a way. We can kind of get to the end, so to speak, where there just isn't anything. But, but to think of that as a nothingness is quite, quite wrong. 
So it's not, as a concept, it's not that useful because it, it seems to imply nothing. Well, in a way, that's right. But as an experience, that very nothing is absolutely everything. And, it, and you, you, your fecundity and the infinite creativity of that is exactly right. They say one analogy that's sometimes used is the mirror. That, you know, the mirror sort of has no characteristics. You know, a really nice, good mirror. It just shows what appears in it. It itself has no characteristics at all. But everything yet it's, is... Free. It's in a way, it's the, the, the source of all characteristics because it, it, can, it can reflect anything. Exactly. It allows anything. Everything and anything is allowed to show itself in the mirror. But it itself is without characteristic. Yeah. So perhaps we could say that, in, that inherent within or latent within the, the ground state of the universe, if we want to call it that, and this is, again, something a physicist would say, is all the, all the laws of nature, all the impulses of intelligence or what have you that, that end up sort of becoming more and more manifest and give rise to the whole universe. Yes, and I, God, I loved what you said about the cubic centimeter of space. Yeah, on having, the level of the vacuum state, not just on the gross level, but at the level of the vacuum state, it said that just even a tiny bit of any place in the whole universe contains more latent or unmanifest energy than is expressed in the whole manifest universe. Well, that's, that's so uh, resonant with what, 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 what I've experienced, is this, this, this basically this, this nothing is just unbelievably powerful. It's sort of bursting forth all the time. And, 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 um, but even, <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing how when it's bursting forth, it's producing, it. everything's arising. It's producing everything. And at the same time, we can actually see in certain kind of experience that everything that's arising from it is still it. In other words, it's still empty. It's so solid and real and also so empty and real on that level as well. So that's, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I've heard you say that you're an atheist, but for the past five minutes, we've been talking about my understanding of God, <laughs> 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 which is that, yeah. I mean, and let's, let's dwell on this a little bit more. I mean, if you take a single cell in your fingertip, um, I know you're fond of Japan. You go over there a lot. Uh, that single cell is more complex than the city of Tokyo, and it's, despite its microscopic size, and it can repair and replicate itself. And it's only one of maybe as many as 100 trillion cells that make up our body, and that's just our body. And then we can keep on going out. I mean, a, a single cubic, what is it, a gram of hydrogen, if you... Um, make the atoms in it the size of unpopped popcorn kernels would, those popcorn kernels would bury the continental United States nine miles deep. Um, so there, and yet each one of those little atoms in, in the, that gram is a perfectly functioning little thing and it is completely coordinated in terms of its influence with all the other gazillion atoms in that gram. So to my way of seeing things the universe is this sort of vast incomprehensibly complex creative expression that is so far from random or accidental that it's ridiculous to use those words and that there's it's seamless in terms of its um in, in terms of the in, intelligence which permeates and orchestrates it there are no gaps so that that intelligence is omnipresent and you'll find it wherever you look throughout the universe if you just look closely and uh, sensitively and um i've said enough you you get where i'm going with this yeah yeah, yeah well I, I love what you're saying i mean what you're describing with that intelligence is what we would call the dharma the Dharma being the sort of law and order and kind of logic, the sort of magical, almost magical, totally magical, marvelous logic by which all things arise the way they do. The, and and um, the, yeah, I mean, I feel somehow, you know, this is the Big Bang. This is the Big Bang happening. And the, 
I, I, I imagine many people would think I'm crazy, but I feel we can drop into a level of experience which is right before the Big Bang happened. And I suspect that's what we do in our Zen shunyata thing, that when we, we and it's right here still. You know, there's the, the, what predated the Big Bang is still here. And then that we can drop into that, and, and that's, I think that might be what we do when we have a profound experience, you know, um, is we, we, we fall into it, because it is still here, it's intrinsic to everything. And I, I mean, I, I agree with every word you said. I just don't feel myself a need to call it something like the G word. Well, it because, has so much baggage, you know, that word that, well, you know. Yeah, and, and it sort of suggests something else somehow. Yeah, it suggests you know? the old guy with a beard and all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, that he's jealous and he's angry and, <laughs> and he's, he's a he. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite. I mean, for me, I feel that I'm a sort of, I'm some kind of radical, <laughs> mystical, spiritual, cosmic atheist who has many, I, mean, I feel I've been sort of utterly blessed by some kinds of experiences that would traditionally have been called religious, but I don't want those guys co-opting it. It's got nothing to do with them. It's much more important. It's not to do with institutions. It's not really to do with humans. Humans have this incredible capacity to taste it and be able to express it in some way, which is really, and to appreciate it, which is really marvelous and important. But, but, but for me, religion, you know, I grew up in, modern Northwestern Europe, where yeah. religions don't have a good name, really. Right. And it may be different in America, where religion no. hasn't, you know, we, you haven't, <laughs> well, okay, but, but we've had hundreds, we had centuries and centuries of religious war. Yeah. And, you know, in the kind of intellectual and cultural climate, which I grew up, uh, religion we, just We've got the Westboro Baptist Church over here. Uh, they're, they're the ones who show up at funerals and say God hates fags and all that. Sh hold, uh, hold up these horrible signs, um, uh, you know. Uh, with, it's, very... it's like you know when I, I I use the word the G word for convenience, um, but you can't use it without defining it. And if we're defining it in terms of the way religions have generally deteriorated into using it, then I'm an atheist too. But if we define it in terms of all the stuff we, I, I was just saying earlier, then there's this sort of ocean of intelligence that permeates us, that is, you know, that we're there, that's within us, that we're within, that is just sort of. Yeah. Yes, and I, maybe maybe I would I would say something about mystery. Yeah, but I sort of I totally totally. Adore. Not the saying mystery. I've got this all figured out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I don't mean mystery on the level of I can't understand it. I mean mystery that there's an actual mystery to this, mm -hmm. to this very moment, to every moment, always. Yeah. And and we and we can, our practice can bring us closer to that. I mean, it, it can it can we can be we can be lost in it in a very beautiful way. And it's, it's again, it's that door of prajna, not knowing before knowing, going down into the mystery. As the mystery actually is not really only down, it's, it's here, it's fully manifesting, just as this moment is, right now. And I, so I prefer, yeah, I could go with mystery. That's good. Yeah, there's some Upanishad that says something like, well, maybe the gods understand it, or maybe they don't. And if they don't, maybe nobody understands it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. But it certainly has nothing to do with belief or anything. I mean, we un or even understanding. I mean, I think what we're ultimately talking about here is experience to whatever extent our, our experience can fathom or resonate with the reality of things. Um, and I think that's the, the you know, exp understanding or being able to explain it is kind of like icing on the cake. Speaking of cake, we'll end this yeah. interview with cake just as we began it. Um, but it, the main cake is the the actual experience of it. Exactly, and and embodying that, and 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 I think you talked earlier about the cup running over, 
So if we're the more deeply we surrender to that and allow that to show itself, the more fully it manifests, I'm sure. And the more, the more the love just guides and spreads, guides us and spreads through the world. And yeah. Okay. So Irene just sent me an email. Um, she says, you're being a bit hypocritical because I know you believe that intelligence takes form, such as deities, etc., angels, guides, they're all part of that divine intelligence. Yeah, I totally believe that. Um, we, we were talking about yeah. that towards the beginning where we talked about perhaps subtle expressions uh, or subtle, subtle beings of some sort or operative somehow in the universe. Um, that, I don't think that conflicts with anything I just said. I, 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 in fact, talking about mystery, I just think that there's, what is it? There's some Shakespeare line. There's a, Horatio, what is it? There's oh, there are, more, did, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than a... Yeah, there are more. What does that go? It's about there. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are in your or my philosophy. Exactly. So I haven't. I haven't got it exactly right. That's actually. about right. Sorry. And that'll always but, be true. I mean, who knows what what yeah. what there is? And you know. Yeah, but I mean, I would agree with you that those things that you that you just uh, that Irene brought up and then you brought up mm -hmm. that they, they would be accommodated in that sort of archetypal realm that we were talking about. Yeah. Subtle in a realm. mythological, subtle realm, exactly. Yeah. Mythological so implies imaginary or unreal, just kind of these wild stories that ancient cultures played with. I, I, don't, I wouldn't use that word, but more just subtle, you know, just be, kind of beneath the obvious crust of surface experience that most people dwell in. Yes, but maybe uh, um, having done some anthropological study, I would say I see mythology a little differently, where in in um, indigenous cultures, mythology is a lived reality, much like subtle, much like archetypal. So it's not for us. I guess it means old stories, but I, I was using it. I actually using the term in a different way, where it's a level of reality that's sort of non-material or subtle, but it's real, and it's not right to call it imaginary. There was this, actually, there was this French scholar called Henri Courbin who studied, who came up with this idea of the mundus imaginalis, or imaginal realm. I mean, it's not the same as imaginary. It's sort of a, it's a kind of a real realm with its own laws and its own dynamics. And, and we go there, it, to whatever extent we go there, we are subject to it. You know, we, it, we don't govern it, it governs us kind of thing. And it can, be a, it can be a very, very important healing level for us. Yeah, and I've interviewed and befriended a number of people for whom experiences of that level or various subtle levels are as commonplace as, you know, our experience of walking through Walmart or something. I mean, it's just, it's part of their daily humdrum. <laughs> Maybe it's not so humdrum experience. And yes, so it's not yes. a matter of belief or imagination or anything else although you know people can imagine these things uh you can get all, all kinds of carried away and that doesn't rule out the possibility of people hallucinating and everything else so there could be unhealthy you know states in which you experience things that aren't really there but that doesn't mean there isn't really something beyond ordinary surface perception that could be experienced in a legitimate way Yes, I quite agree. And we, you know, we there are people who come and, and sit in the zendo who, you know, who have who are more open to that than others. And some some may have sort of encounters with ancestors, even Zen ancestors or Dharma spirits or something. And you know, but we that, and that's great, and it can be very helpful. It's just for us that's not awakened. it's a side thing. Yeah, it, yeah. It, well, yeah, or it could be it could be in a main line of progress or something in practice because it could be very important mm. but it's not actually it's not they, the they too it's not the ultimate they too right. are subject to exactly as you put it actually they too are a manifestation mm -hmm. of the basic the basic reality yeah in fact some say that those subtle beings need to take human birth in order to attain enlightenment that the, you somehow the human's ability to span the full spectrum of of creation and and be rooted in the, as you say, that which is prior to the Big Bang is sort of a unique gift, uh, which some of these subtle beings just don't have in their, 
yeah. realm of possibility. Yes, that is definitely an idea in the Buddhist world that there are six paths of of being of beings. You know, the, and um, the best the best one is not the, the the highest one is sort of gods, and the next one is kind of semi divine uh, spiritual entities, and then there's humans, and and on down to way down to hell and hungry ghosts and hell. And, um, and actually humans are sort of the most propitious or auspicious one to be born in because we got the right level of suffering and awareness. And so you need some suffering and you need some awareness and we've got the right proportions of that. Yeah, <laughs> to, be able, to be able to awaken. Otherwise we wouldn't awaken. Yeah, I've heard it said that angels enjoy so much they don't want to close their eyes. They don't, they're not interested in you know, enlightenment or meditation or anything else, they're, they're just sort of dwelling in a beautiful realm. Um, but it's it's not conducive to, in fact, some say that that's true of the age we live in, that the difficulties of it are perhaps uh, an, uh, an impetus or an incentive to seek enlightenment that we might not have in a, in a more, you know, comfortable age. Yes, I've wondered about that. I mean, in just a one little side uh, tangential point there would be with Zen and Chan. You know, it evolved in a in a time of great flourishing in China, but it was also a time of great difficulty. There was a civil war right in the middle of that period that's supposed to have been, uh, in terms of the, the the number of people killed as a proportion of the total world population, the most catastrophic war there's ever been. Some, you know, there were something like 35 million people in China are said to have died in and after that war, through partly through the war, partly through famine and disease afterwards. And um, the population was 51 million at the time. So that was like two thirds of the Chinese population. And the world population was, I think, something like 250 million back then. There was a massive amount of human beings killed. But that was when Zen was honed, and and um, what's the word? Uh, what's that word I'm looking for? When you put something tempered, you know? tempered like right, like like in, uh, they do with steel or whatever to make it strong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. Hmm. Well, um, what haven't we talked about that after we hang up, you're going to say, "Oh God, I wish we'd talked about that." Anything? Oh, I'm I mean, feeling... is, we'll, we'll wrap it up at the end by talking about what you have to offer and you know a little bit about mountain, the Mountain Cloud Center and stuff like that. But is there anything else that we want to be sure to cover? Well, I'm, right now I'm feeling very happy and sort of my heart is full. And I, I'm, I'm actually very, I feel very grateful that we can, you know, that, well, again, that you have me on the show. I'm not feeling, there's nothing sort of nagging at me, like, hey, what about this? What about that? I'm enjoying Actually, Yeah. Good. Um, <laughs> wouldn't want to be have anything nagging at you, but it just occurred to me that there's a couple of questions that people sent in earlier. I want to be sure to ask them. Where are they in my notes? Let me put my glasses on here. Um, okay. Okay. Here's, here's one from a fellow named Josh in Salem, Oregon. Josh asks, how do you teach beginners to find the hara? You'll have to explain what the hara is. What is the importance and purpose of developing the hara in Zen practice? Yeah, he's referring to, thank you, Josh, he's referring to this, um, what's called the dantian in Chinese. It's a sort of energy center deep in the belly, basically. And there has been an emphasis in some schools of Zen of putting one's attention there when doing breath practice, so that you would you would try to basically experience the breath in the abdomen, rather than say in the the, the chest or or in some traditions you you know you focus at the, the nostrils, breath coming and going out. Um, traditionally, in some not all schools of Zen, you would tradition you would focus down in the hara region, which is supposed to be like a couple of fingers behind and below the navel. You put your attention there. Um, so that's how I would teach it. You put, you put, you imagine sort of a little, a zone, 
a little bit behind and below the navel. And you just put your attention there and experience the breath down there as you breathe in and breathe out. However, it's not the only way to do breath practice in Zazen. It's okay to focus on the breath more generally in the belly or wherever it happens to be. It may be in the chest. It may be more solar plexus that you experience it. That's fine. You just, you just track the inhales and the exhales. That's enough. You don't have to be too... Um, I mean, some people benefit by doing hara practice at certain times and we'll, we can, you know, they can do that and, but it's not, it's not, um, it's not that critical for all people. Okay. Um, here's a question from our friend Rob Mogan in Encinitas. Uh, he's the one who first told me about you. Um, he said, um, what is looking, what, here's a quote, first of all, what, what's looking is what you're looking for is a statement credited to a number of contemplatives over millennia, from St. Francis of Assisi to Nisargadatta Maharaj to Alan Watts to Sam Harris. Um, the teaching has been repeated over and over throughout recorded history. So my questions are, what is looking? And how can we directly realize and experience that? Well, I don't know if Rob's listening right now, but Rob, look for it. That's what I'd like to say to you. You're asking how, the answer is look for it. Who is it? Who is it seeing? Who is it hearing? Who is it breathing? Who is it feeling? Ask yourself that question, those questions, gently but insistently and diligently and repeatedly. And it somehow seems to help to have I'm not sure if this is the right thing to say, actually. I was going to say guidance, teachers. You know, when you ask me what, would I, what might I wish I'd said or something when we, when we finish, actually, just after I said nothing, um, I'm feeling so full of joy and appreciation for this. Actually, seriously, Rick, I am. Um, me too. But, but, but then something did come to me, teachers. I don't think I've said how important it's been for me to have teachers, that it was like, you know, and I feel um, uh, so, for somebody who was so suspicious and couldn't trust, especially male authority figures, and I really had a, I was a rebellious guy and had a difficult time with my dad as a kid and, you know, there's history there and stuff. But when I realized that there was somebody who just didn't have really much of an agenda of his own. That was the first teacher I really entrusted myself to. He wasn't trying to build a center. He wasn't trying to build a community. He wasn't trying to do anything. He was just offering the Dharma because it had meant so much to him. He was somebody who'd been a sort of high-powered lawyer, and he'd, um, and he'd had a little niggling sense that there must be more and, and, had, and had gone to a talk by a, a Zen master, a woman called... Uh, Sister Elaine McInnes, actually, an amazing woman in London. She'd come to visit and he'd gone to the talk and go, Ah, I want to do this. I want to do this. So he started training with her. And all, you know, his, his life changed so much through the practice that he gave up. He retired young, early, and set up two charities helping severely disabled people. And, um, and by the time I met him, when he'd been authorized as a teacher by his teachers, um, you know, he, 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 he just was doing nothing but serving the Dharma and serving beings. And to realize that there could be somebody like that who, and who was willing to sort of meet me where I was and understand, you know, wh what was going on with this being called Henry. Uh, without trying to, you know, co-opt him for any project of their own, just to help this other person. It was an amazing thing to find that there are people doing that and, and who really don't have a personal agenda that's sort of secretly behind it, which is what I always thought, you know, because I've been to some big centers and, Somehow I always felt some, there was some ego trip going on, at least to the way I, the way I saw it. Maybe I just wasn't 
enlightened enough back then to realize how good they really were. But I, I always felt you know, there's a little bit of a power trip of some kind going on here. I don't want any part of it. But, but so, you know, I think, I think um, if, there's, if, we, if we're earnest seekers, then for, for some of us, it's right to seek a bit of guidance. Sure. The, the teacher can be like, why should there be a problem with that, really? Yeah. I mean, are you asking me? No, why should well, there be? Why, why we, there be? Yeah. It's, we seek guidance in just about every other field of life. If we want to get a pilot's license, we get trained by someone who knows how to fly. And if we want to be a yeah. surgeon, we have to go to medical school. And why shouldn't there be something like that in the, in the realm of spirituality? Well, I mean, I would say, as, as, as now, I would say, well, because there been, there's been so much abuse of that role, you know, and where it's understandable that it's very difficult to trust it. Because, you know, appalling things have been done by people in positions of supposed spiritual authority. And I think there's a particular damage when it's spiritual authority, you know. And so I think it's understandable that we're wary, and, um, or some of us are. And, but I, I, on, on the other hand, you know, I feel it's like a, a teacher is a little bit like a tree, like the tree that Buddha sat under. You know, there's, a, there's an idea in Buddhism that only a Buddha can awaken a Buddha, another Buddha. That you sort of have to be in the shelter of another Buddha to become a Buddha. And, and um, this is Buddha with a small B, I guess, not a capital B. And I think, well, what about Buddha? So but because of that problem, actually, they, it became a problem because who, who was the Buddha that had awakened the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha? So then they invented seven Buddhas before Buddha. And then ultimately <laughs> that led to thousands upon thousands of earlier Buddhas. But I feel, actually, the real, the real Buddha was the tree, the tree under which he sat. And that that's what a teacher can be, is somehow a, a shelter under which we can go through what we need to go through in, within a kind of somehow sort of sheltered space where it's safe to go through whatever we go through and um, or whatever needs to be gone through in order for us to awaken. So this has been a wonderful conversation, as I knew it would be. Um, I've really, time flies um, when you're having fun. And um, I really enjoyed the whole thing. And, I, and if I get down to Santa Fe again, I want to spend some more time with you there. But in the meanwhile, um, people who have been listening to this or watching this, you mentioned you go to Europe, you go to Japan, you're in New Mexico. Um, what are You go to California. Um, how can people sort of connect with you? First of all, they can read your book, uh, which they'll enjoy. But how can they connect with you more directly and personally? Um, in a teacher-student role if they want to? Well, <clears throat> you know, you could, um, they could come to Santa Fe, to Mountain Cloud, to join one of our introductory, re introductory retreats. That might be a good way to start. Or come and stay at Mountain Cloud when there isn't a retreat going on and we can just, you know, meet um, during that stay. Come to a longer retreat if you feel ready for it. Um, or I, I do uh, sessions with people online, uh, you know, through Skype or Zoom or FaceTime, whatever. Um, so that's also a possibility. Quite a few people work with me all, all over the world, actually. Um, well, I mean, not all over the world, in various parts of the world. They, from like anywhere, it's from. possible, yeah. Yeah, so there's some people are doing that. You know, they might have a, an hour session every couple of weeks or something like that, so we, we can keep checking in on their practice. That's, that's the, everyone's welcome to do that if they want. Um, and, and I go to Encinitas twice a year. I go to Esalen um, once a year. I'm going in late January doing a marvelous course with my friend T.S. Little, who's a fantastic yoga teacher. And at the end of that, we're having a specially sort of weekend dedicated to just meditation. Um, that's in early 2020. So they actually go to all I'm saying really you could find on the Mountain Cloud website. I hope you'll you know people might be moved or inspired to try reading One Blade of Grass, the book, and um, that interesting that's, book. 
Um, is that what else? I think that's, that's pretty that's, good. Well, you do have a podcast which I've listened to at least a dozen episodes of, and um, I found that very interesting. So you can subscribe to that through iTunes and maybe Stitcher or some of those other things. You'll you'll find probably there's a link to that on your website, right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's enough. That will keep me busy for a while. <laughs> 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 and so all that thing, all those things, uh, you know, that we've just mentioned, I'll, I'll link to from Henry's um, page on batgap.com in case you're listening to this while you're driving. You don't need to write it all down or anything. You can just <clears throat> go to that page and follow the links. Well, thank you so much, Rick. I hope it won't be too long before you come back to Santa Fe. I'd love to get more in-person time with you. Yeah, if I do, it'll probably be next June or so. I think I'll be around then. Good. Okay. Well, thank you, Henry. I really could do this another two hours and, and uh, we'd probably dig up more to talk about, but uh, this is good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you again. I'm very honored, actually, that you, you, you've you decided to you know have me on. No, and, you're a great um, guest. That's very kind of you to say so. And yeah. uh, I hope you've had some nice cake in, you know, that went into your mouth yesterday. Yeah, Irene bought me a cheesecake. She didn't think I should have it, but I don't have it very often, just on my birthday maybe. So I had a little cheesecake. And uh, <laughs> last night we ate with a friend at an Italian restaurant and I had this great thing. I don't remember what it was called, but very tasty. <laughs> so I've been, <laughs> the dessert, yeah. Panna cotta. So I I've, been, love it. I've, I've indulged a bit. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. Okay. Well, thanks. Let me just uh, make the usual concluding remarks. I'll keep them brief. Um, this is this interview has been one in an ongoing series. And if this is new to you, um, well, even if it isn't, uh, go to batgap.com and check out the menus and see if there's something there that interests you, such as the audio podcast, if you're watching this as a video, or the um, what else? You can, you can sign up to be notified by email of uh, each new interview if you want to be notified when it comes out. You can do that on YouTube, too. You can, if, you, if you like to watch them as opposed to listen to them, you, there's a little subscribe button. But next to that, there's a little bell icon. And I discovered not too long ago that if you click the bell icon, YouTube notifies you of everything that gets posted on our channel as opposed to just some of the things. And everything isn't a lot. It's just once a week we post something. So... Thank you for listening or watching. Next week, I'll be interviewing a woman named Annette Kaiser, who was a student of Irina Tweedy, who wrote that book, Daughter of Fire. And she lives in Switzerland, and it looks like it's going to be a very interesting conversation. So hope to see you for that one. Thanks, Henry. Thank you so much, Rick. <laughs>